Hello. I'm Joseph Rochino, talking about my book, Conducting Opera Where Theater Meets Music. In the last video, I spoke about the different techniques a composer uses to bind together a large work, or at least large sections of his work. In this video, I want to talk about the technique most important for conductors, tempo. More specifically, how to make transitions from one tempo to another. Now, most of the time, the goal is to make these transitions smooth and inevitable. Very often, a composer will help us because he gives specific instructions about how this is to be achieved. He'll write things like, presto, doppio tempo, fast, twice the speed. Or he might write, doppio più lento, twice as slow. In other cases, he may give us an equation. In this case, quarter equals eighth. The speed of the quarter in one section now becomes the speed of the eighth in the other section. In another case, the conductor may have to do a little more detective work. We may be going at a metronome given of 120 in an allegro, for example. And then we see adagio, but we see a different metronome. Now, if the 120 in the new section says 60, we know that the composer expects us to go exactly twice as slow. I'd like to play a little section of Act One of Verdi's opera, Otello, where the first principle is used, where specific, a specific sentence is given by Verdi. He writes, presto doppio tempo, fast, twice the speed. Now this occurs in a recitativo after the chorus of Fuoco di Gioia and before the long chorus where Cassio becomes drunk. The metronome given by Verdi in the first chorus is 120. No indication of a change of speed is given in the recitativo. However, because it is recitativo, a very, very slight slowing down is normal and to be expected and will help when, it's, when, he get, when he says double the speed. In addition, besides, besides saying double the speed, for the last three measures or four measures of this patter, he says incalzando, getting still faster. Then he returns to the speed 120 and the whole new section will go at that speed. This is what it sounds like. Iago canterà e le sue lodi lo ascolta. Io non sono che un critico e della donna lode più bella ti guarda da quel cassio che temi. E fa vela già che tu puoi volare la gliarda del giovedì sono sprona. Un astuto sedutor che ti incombri cammino bada. Se si deve perduto fallo ber. Qua ragazzi del vino. Now, what does this achieve when executed exactly as indicated? One, a tremendous propulsion through that whole transition. And number two, it shows the chameleon-like qualities of Iago. He talks a certain way to Cassio. He whispers very, very fast instructions to Rodrigo, and then in that calmer speed addresses the chorus. It also keeps the storyline, the machinations of Iago to the destruction of Otello and the death of Desdemona constantly going. And in, even in the third act, he, Verdi uses this principle where he gives specific instructions to keep the pulse going in the duet between Otello and Desdemona. Granted, 
This is not easy to accomplish. That passage for Yago is a real tongue twister, even for a native speaker. But if I could do it, certainly a good Yago, a good baritone, could do it also. Now, I'd like to talk about another way the composer shows the connection. The one I mentioned last, through metronomic indications. In this, later on in, the, in Act One, in this case, we've been going on at 132 to the quarter note, and the speed changes, and he gives 66. 66 is exactly half of 132, and it creates a beautiful, seamless transition. Now you may ask, what do you do in music where the composer doesn't give these relationships specifically? He doesn't write little equations and there are no metronomes. Take the music of Mozart. He never writes, keep the same speed, twice as fast, twice as slow. There are no metronomes because it hadn't been invented yet. Let's examine a little history. When we have the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, he often didn't even indicate what speed he wanted the piece at to start. You might occasionally see something like Andante in the middle of a piece, meaning go slow. He often didn't write dynamics at all. He left all of this, the choice of speed, the choice of volume, to the performer. In Mozart, he gives tempo indications four numbers. He gives dynamics, but he never gives indications of how transitions are to be made. But there was a convention at that time, the convention of constant pulse. What do I mean? Take a little aria that's in 2-4 that has a concluding section in 6-8. When Mozart didn't write any new tempo marking over the 6-8. What was expected was that the pulse remained the same. That is, the pulse of 2-4 is the same as the pulse of 6-8, so that the quarter note in 2-4 is the same speed as the dotted quarter note in 6-8. Keeping that in mind, this idea of constant pulse this was also expected in uniting many sections in a long part of a composition, like that long finale that we spoke about in the last video that ends Act Two of The Marriage of Figaro. I said that it was held together through six different keys, beginning in E flat, modulating through various keys and ending up at last in E flat again. It actually has 10 different sections. And for the most part, all of these sections are held together by the concept of constant pulse. I'd like to play the end of the first section, Allegro. There's a long fermata rest, and then going into the next section, which is molto andante. The first section is in 4-4, the second section is in 3-8, but 
the constant pulses, the pulse of the half note in the first section is the same pulse as the eighth note in the second section. That is, the speed of my beat remains constant from beating two, beating half notes, to beating three, beating eighth notes. Susanna! Susanna! Signore! Now, another thing to consider was at this time, and for most of the bel canto following in Italy, there were no conductors. The composer, supervised the first couple of performances from the controlling things from the keyboard and then left and left it up to the theater and later theaters to maintain what had been done in the first couple of performances under his supervision the concert master the first violin that is controlled the orchestra, and the prompter controlled the stage. And hopefully, most of the time, the stage and the orchestra were together. Because of this, the idea of constant pulse was absolutely essential. There could not have been constant fluctuation of tempo, it would have been impossible to control without a conductor. So this idea of, in late romantic music, of ebb and flow became only possible once we had conductors in opera. Now this does not mean that every single transition is done through constant pulse. There's an example in Act 4 of Figaro, in the finale, where we connect a section called Più Andante to the following section marked Larghetto. Now, Larghetto is slower than Più Andante, but how much slower? Well, if we wanted a constant pulse, the only way we could have a constant pulse is to go twice as slow, which would be unsingable and, frankly, for the audience, unbearable. But yet, that principle of uniting the different sections must be maintained. What I heard most of my life was a retard that the conductor made in the little orchestral section, the, the few measures between the two sections. Number one, that's not very Mozartian. Mo Mozart, to my knowledge, almost never wrote retard, and certainly in the opera there is no retard. In fact, there is one place in the whole opera where he writes, Col la voce, follow the singer. And yet, a connection should be made. A smooth one. Dramatically, a retard also makes no sense. Why? Even though the music that Figaro sings in the Larghetto is slower, he enters very agitated. He thinks his new wife, Susanna, is betraying him and meeting the Count in this garden. So he is not calm, and a retard would calm the mood. So that is both musically and dramatically incorrect. After years of thought, I came up with this solution. Now, if you want to know how each of the ten sections in the second act finale are joined 
smoothly, I have a table giving you the exact method of joining each of the sections. And if you want to know the technical means used to create the transition you just heard me play, that's also in my book. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, to go more into depth, I encourage you to read the book. I also ask you to subscribe to the channel and to share it with friends that may be interested in the subject. Thank you very much.